Let's break down the term hemochromatosis. Hemo refers to blood, chromat refers to color, and osis refers to a condition or a disease. Now this makes perfect sense because hemochromatosis is a condition where your blood changes the color of your body tissues due to excessive iron deposition. In medicine, the term actually refers to iron overload in general. Think of acquired and congenital causes. But this video is specifically about hereditary hemochromatosis, which refers to a genetic form of the disease caused by iron dysregulation and absorption. It's usually an autosomal recessive disorder that primarily affects the liver and joints, and it's really highly prevalent in white populations, so much so that it's known as the Celtic curse in Northern Europe. To break down its pathophysiology, let's just recap iron absorption. So normally, dietary iron is absorbed into the duodenum. This is done by gut cells called enterocytes. Iron is then exported into the blood through a protein called ferroportin. The amount of iron that is actually absorbed is actually regulated by hepatocytes from the liver, which detect plasma iron levels. Now, it does this using a protein complex, which is made up of a couple of subunits like HFE, which stands for hemostatic iron regulator, hemojuvulin, and transferrin receptor 2. All of these proteins have a unique role in sensing iron levels. When they think iron levels are too high, they tell hepatocytes to produce more of a protein called hepcidin. This provides negative feedback because hepcidin inhibits ferroportin channels from releasing iron into the blood. Congenital hemochromatosis is classified into four main types, now each resulting in iron dysregulation at different points of this process. So type 1 is also known as hereditary HFE hemochromatosis, and that's the main focus of this video. It's the most common type, accounting for 95% of cases, and it's due to a mutation in the HFE gene. This means hepatocytes lose the ability to appropriately increase hepcidin levels and provide the normal negative feedback resulting in iron overload. Type 2, or juvenile hemochromatosis, is surprisingly a result of a mutation in the hemojuvulin gene. It has an earlier onset and is characterized by hypogonadism and cardiomyopathy. Type 3, or transferrin receptor 2 hemochromatosis, Surprise, surprise, is due to a mutation in the transferrin receptor 2 gene, and it affects middle-aged and young adults, resembling type 1 hemochromatosis. Finally, type 4, or ferroportin disease, is distinct from the others, because it's an autosomal dominant disorder, which results in issues with the ferroportin channel, meaning it's an issue with the enterocytes, not the hepatocytes like the other diseases. The clinical features of the disease is kind of based on how advanced it is, and patients can only really present in one of four ways. One, a genetic predisposition without abnormalities. Imagine finding out a relative has the disease, and then you go to your GP. Two, iron overload without symptoms. It's just incidentally found. Three, iron overload with symptoms like arthritis, and that might be the presenting complaint. Four, iron overload with actual organ damage like cirrhosis. Lots of organs are affected, so I made a dirty mnemonic to help remember all of them. I think of the term CHAD gonads. C stands for cardiac issues, which are common because the heart is a major deposition site for iron. It can lead to structural diseases like dilated cardiomyopathy and conduction disturbances. H is for hepatomegaly, which is present in 95% of symptomatic patients and is usually the first organ involved. This can proceed to complications like cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinoma. A is for arthritis, which occurs in about 25% of people and it usually affects the joints in the hands to start. A progressive polyarthritis involving the wrists, hips and knees may also ensue. And it can have radiological findings that are indistinguishable from pseudogout, which is also known as calcium pyrophosphate crystal deposition disease, like chondrocalcinosis. 
D is for diabetes and can result from pancreatic iron overload. Interestingly, it appears that iron deposition is relatively selective for beta cells that produce insulin over alpha cells which secrete glucagon. Gonadal dysfunction results from deposition in the anterior pituitary. Now, this results in a decreased production of gonadotrophins, making one sequelae secondary hypogonadism. Manifestations usually include loss of libido, impotence, amenorrhea, and testicular atrophy. Excessive skin pigmentation is another key feature of advanced hemochromatosis, and it's a consequence of excess melanin and iron in the dermis. The metallic hue is often described as bronzing, and it's diffuse. Consider the following approach to investigating hemochromatosis. If a patient presents with clinically suspicious symptoms, or unexplained liver disease, or has a first-degree relative with HH, then perform iron studies including a transferrin saturation and serum ferritin. An increased transferrin saturation reflects increased absorption of iron, and an increased serum ferritin normally reflects high body iron stores, Although, please note that it can be high during inflammatory processes, as it's an acute phase reactant. If the ferritin is lower than 300 and the transferrin saturation is lower than 45%, you can reassure the patient and consider retesting later, as they're unlikely to have hemochromatosis. Now, if either of these are high and you're considering HH as the diagnosis, then you might want to proceed to HFE genetic testing. If this is negative, you can also consider non-HFE-related hemochromatosis. Regardless, if either are positive, the next step is to consider assessing the degree of iron deposition in the tissues, and how advanced the hemochromatosis actually is. Liver involvement can be assessed using blood tests like LFTs. Imaging via a liver MRI is a great non-invasive way to estimate liver iron content with good sensitivity and specificity, but you can also think about a liver biopsy, which is the most sensitive and specific test for measuring liver iron content. Sex hormones should be assessed via testosterone, estrogen, FSH, and LH assays. And remember, hypogonadism is usually secondary, associated with low rather than a high gonadotrophins. Finally, cardiac involvement can be investigated with ECGs and echoes. Now, management revolves around lifestyle modification, removal of excess body iron, and organ damage monitoring. Lifestyle modification includes eliminating alcohol consumption because it increases the risk of cirrhosis by nearly tenfold. Dietary adjustments are unnecessary. Removal of excess iron is best done via regular phlebotomy. An initial course of one or two venesections per week is performed until the excess iron stores are removed. And once this is achieved, patients usually just require one venesection every four months to keep iron stores at low levels without rendering the patient iron deficient. An alternative method of treatment is with desferoxamine, a chelating agent but this is costly, and in practice, it's rarely needed. Monitoring for organ damage, especially liver involvement, is vital. Patients with cirrhosis have a risk of primary liver cancer even when complete iron depletion is achieved. These patients should be screened every six months with hepatic ultrasounds and serum alpha theta protein levels. To remember some key facts about this disease, I use two mnemonics. Chad Gonads tells us which organs are impacted, but for management, I use my copyrighted Townsend teaching rhyme, which goes like this. Abstain, drain the vein, desferoxamine, and retest again. This reminds me to tell a patient to abstain from alcohol, have regular veni sections, or remove the excess iron with a chelating agent, and to continue monitoring organ health. These mnemonics are the best way I remember content as a doctor, so don't forget to check out the rest of my videos, all of which end with bespoke mnemonics. Thanks for watching Townsend Teaching.